happen on so many, so many aspects of your life, but you can learn to be content because you know Him, because you know the one who knows, the one who's in control. You can rest in your relationship with Him no matter what is happening around you. The unbelieving world gets their security from money, from skill, talent, physical beauty, connections, control. All of these things are subject to loss or decline. Mm -hmm. Only the Christian gets his or her security from a relationship that can't be taken away. Amen. It only gets sweeter with time. Jesus. Do you want to see how important relationship is? Check this out. When Jesus was set to leave this earth and return to the Father, you would think that he would want to offer the disciples the absolute best resource that he could possibly offer them. Maybe a holy book, maybe a holy relic that falls from heaven, maybe a statue, you know, who knows, maybe a, a sacred place that they could go to. John 16, 5 to 7 and 13 says, now, now I am going to him who sent me. Then none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief, but I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Christ offered his burgeoning church the very best thing he could, he could offer them upon his departure. He offered them a person. When he left them, he offered them a relationship. Now consider this. Do we know of any occasion in the life of Christ when he expressed really intense emotion about anything? Some might say, well, you know, obviously when he made a cord out of, out of ropes and he, you know, cleared the money changes from the temple, you know, he was pretty upset, right? Pretty intense. And that's true. But... The precise words that he said when that happened were, get out of here, how dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace, right? So it sounds to me like the passion that he's expressing is really all about his father. And when he was in Gethsemane, which is the next occasion when he expressed intense emotion, uh, it says that prior to his arrest, they went to their usual place. So he had been there many times before at the Mount of Olives. And he asked the disciples to pray. And then he withdrew uh, at about a stone's throw away from them to, to pray privately. And we all know the prayer, right? Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, right? Yet not my will be done, but yours. And being in anguish, Luke says that he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. That's intense. You know, there really is a biological process. And I can't even remember the word, him. Is something other. The word is not important, but there's a biological, biological process where the pressure is so intense that the capillaries near to the skin burst and, the, and, and small amounts of blood mix with sweat as, as, as we sweat. What was, the question is really, what was such incredibly intense anguish all about? Like all my life, I thought it must be about the cross. It must be about this terrible torture that he was about to face. I mean, who wants to go through that? Who wants to be stripped naked, have your, you know, the flesh out of your back stripped out of you and be nailed to a piece of wood and have a crown of thorn placed? You know, who wants to go through that? And I always thought it was the cross that he was worried about. But the more I thought of it, the more I realized that many martyrs of the church had endured great torture. I mean, being set on fire and, and torn to pieces and, and, and displayed great dignity and poise in the midst of that torture. I mean, was the Son of God so terrified of the physical torture of the cross that he would ask to be spared the ordeal when Peter not only accepted it graciously, but asked to be crucified upside down? Listen, I'd like to suggest that it wasn't the cross that terrified Jesus, but the separation from the Father. Wow. When he was on that cross, he cried out, Father, Father, why? Why have you forsaken me? That was what he what terrified. That was what he had never known in his entire life. John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the, begin, in the beginning, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word was with God. It says that he was with God in the beginning. It emphasizes that the Word was with God. 
The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 8, 29 says, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Wow. For I always do what pleases Him. John 4, 14, 31 says, The world must learn that I love the Father, and I do exactly what the Father has commanded me to do. John 17, 5 says, Father, glorify me in your presence that we have before the world began. He had never been separated from the Father. The one thing that he had never known was distance in that relationship. And that's what terrified him more than anything else. Clearly, the most important thing to Jesus was his relationship with the Father. And that's what he offers us. Amen. That's what he offers us when, when they saw him, when the disciples saw him, they saw the Father. When they heard him, they heard the Father. Now when he went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit made Jesus present in every believer. Now a lost world would encounter Jesus through his children. That's what we have as believers. The ability to encounter Jesus in one another. The ability to encounter Jesus in his word. The ability to encounter him in the fellowship of the saints when we gather together in this way. The ability to encounter Him in so many ways through the Holy Spirit that He's left with us and for us and in us. And yet, we're busy trying to find completeness and wholeness in so many things. Like Israel, we keep looking forward to the land. We keep looking forward to the thing where we're going to be able to be free and we're going to be able to, to do all kinds of things and have a good job and have money, have a nice place to live. And, and we're so focused on the things, we're so focused on the land and what the land represents, that we keep ignoring the relationship. We keep ignoring the one who's with us, and in us, and for us. We have to cultivate that relationship. We have to make it our home. We have to reside in Him. We have to dwell in Him, and learn to, to make Him our endpoint, to make Him our objective. We can't separate the destiny from the relationship. Amen. If we were able to have the land apart from Him, if you got that promotion, if you got that degree, if you got that house, if you got that car, if you got that place in the burbs, if you got all those things that you think would make you happy, if you got the land without the relationship, you would be just like everybody else. Having to find coping mechanisms to deal with the things that threaten your security in life. Being incomplete. Still empty. Still wow. lonely. Still singing like that old 50s singer. Is that all there is? Listen. The best thing that God offers us is not something we have to wait for. It's something that we have. Amen. Can we stand? Jesus. The relationship is everything. The relationship is everything. The relationship is everything. Let's ask God to teach us to understand that we're on a journey. I understand that there's a place I have to go. I understand that there's stuff I have to do. Stuff that will make sense out of my life. Stuff that will make sense out of the gifts that He's given me. Stuff that will make sense out of experiences that I've had in the past. That's valid. That's important. I'm on a journey. There's a promised land. But let's also understand that without the relationship, without the relationship, the land is pointless. Moses said to God, if you don't go with us. He said, if you don't go with us, don't send us. Don't send us. I don't want the destiny without the God. Amen. I want the relationship. I want God to teach me to begin to just stop yes. and fix my eyes on Him yes. and sit at His feet like Mary who chose the best Jesus. and cultivate that relationship. How can we cultivate a relationship with someone that we, when we never stop to focus on them, to listen to them, to converse with them, to love them? When we begin prayer, we begin by asking for stuff. How about beginning prayer by just worshiping? 